Hi, I'm Eldrick Stoneskin, and the video essay that you're about to watch is the seventh and final part in a series containing my theory surrounding the secret of the Winterfell crypts, and ultimately, the key to defending humanity against the coming onslaught of the others. I believe that the hero of the last long night was the progenitor of the Stark bloodline, who traveled north in search of ancient magic and found the white-haired weirwood woman we see in Bran's weirwood vision and brought her back to the site now known as Winterfell to establish the Winterfell heart tree, so he and his companions could become eternal stone men seated on thrones beneath the earth, their spirits residing within the weirwoods to bypass the laws of time, awaiting the sounding of the horn of winter thousands of years in the future that will wake these giant men from beneath the earth when the others return. And it just so happens, there is another magical phenomenon associated with the Weirwoods that the Greenseers are said to be able to call forth that causes the old gods within the Weirwoods to stir and wakes giants in the earth. An exact match for our theory known as the Hammer of the Waters. And as we are about to discuss, might be the reason Bran Stark must learn to become a Greenseer so he too can call forth the hammer of the waters and wake his giant stone ancestors from the green sea of the weirwoods, resulting in giants waking from beneath the earth. As we've discussed in previous videos, I believe that the Horn of Winter was a gift from the children of the forest, which when blown, wakes the kings of winter, whose spirits reside within the weirwoods while their bodies reside beneath the earth. And if we look to the Hammer of the Waters, we find a very similar story, as we hear that the Greenseers used song, which is suggestive of horns, to cause the old gods within the weirwoods to stir, which is said to have resulted in giants waking from the earth. And I believe the idea of the old gods stirring in the Hammer of the Waters myth is the process of the spirits within the trees, the old gods, waking and returning to their ancient stone bodies beneath the ground and rising as giants from the earth. It's even suggested that the Greenseers were capable of this through another example of the children's magic we've already discussed in part four, in which Asher recalls a story about the Greenseers turning the trees to warriors during their wars with the first men, which I suggest is the waking of the spirits within the trees causing them to return to their bodies beneath the weirwood, which could also be described as the old gods stirring and giants waking in the earth. And knowing the hammer of the waters was also used in the wars against the first men, perhaps what Asher is remembering is a smaller scale hammer or the hammer of the waters itself, where the green seers caused the old gods to stir and turned the spirits in the trees to warriors. Another tactic we hear the Green Seers use in their wars against the First Men is their skin-changing abilities, as we hear in the world of ice and fire that they could call the beasts of marsh, forest and air to fight on their behalf. Dire wolves and monstrous snow bears, cave lions and eagles, mammoths and serpents, and more. Which brings me to my theory, as I think the symbolism I've uncovered, which I'll be discussing over the course of this video, points to the fact that the Greenseers were in fact skin changing these giants beneath the earth and piloting their bodies to fight on their behalf, much like we see with the Greenseers skin changing animals to do just the same. An idea foreshadowed by Bran, a child who must learn the art of Greenseeing to save the realms of men, which as we'll discuss later, has already been skin changing a giant through the series so far. And if this is the case, and the Hammer of the Waters was in fact the Green Seer's skin-changing giants beneath the earth, this would align with the abilities we hear the children have, far more than the theorised earthquakes suggested, an ability that seems beyond the scope of the magic of the Green Seers, whose main magical abilities seem to be green seeing and skin-changing. And to continue this line of investigation, if we look closely at the myths surrounding the Hammer of the Waters, we find it said that the hammer was called down by the green seers, which brings me to my next point. As there is a natural phenomenon in the real world that in ancient history was believed to be the power of the gods 
striking down from the heavens, which a certain ancient culture interpreted as a hammer crashing down from above, which as we're about to discuss, is strongly connected to the Weirwoods, Greenseers and Bran Stark. Lightning is nature at its most powerful and was a natural phenomenon that ancient people attributed to the power of the gods. And in some cultures, lightning and the accompanying sound of thunder was perceived as being the sound of a hammer of the gods crashing down from above due to the loud sound as this force of the gods strikes the earth. And it's this ancient belief that inspired a very well-known god from Norse myth known as Thor with Thor being imagined as a hammer-wielding god associated with lightning, thunder, storms, sacred trees, and the protection of humankind, with thunder being perceived as the sound of his hammer crashing down on his foes, while the Old Norse name for his hammer, Mjolnir, may have meant lightning as well, making Thor a storm god in every sense. And the fact that lightning and thunder are historically interpreted as hammers of the gods striking down from above tells me that perhaps the hammer of the waters was in fact a lightning strike, a symbolic hammer that the green seers called down which woke giants in the earth. And if the green seers ability to call down the hammer of the waters is in fact the summoning of lightning and a resulting storm from the storm god above, this would align with the explanation the maesters have of why and how the Arm of Dawn broke, which is said to have been shattered by seas rushing in and the force of water breaking the land, which may have been caused by the storms and wind brought about by the summoning of this lightning. And the idea of the Green Seer's summoning lightning does seem very plausible, as George has introduced his version of a storm god in a song of ice and fire, and it's suggested that this storm god is tied to the magic of the Green Seer's by Aaron Dampere, who thinks in A Feast for Crows that ravens were the creatures of the storm god, with ravens obviously being associated with skin changing, green seeing, and the old gods. And if green seers have the ability to call down the hammer, which is in fact lightning, then it's very interesting that Bran Stark, who needs to learn to become a green seer to save the realms of men, is so closely associated with lightning which as we'll discuss later in the video, seems to occur around receiving his skin changing gift and also occur around his skin changing of a giant in Hodor as well. And to further this idea of green seers summoning a symbolic hammer of lightning, if we look to the story of the Grey King, a potential green seer through his connection to the Weirwoods, we hear that he taunted the storm god until he lashed down with a thunderbolt setting a tree ablaze, showing us a potential green seer calling down a symbolic hammer of lightning that struck a tree and set it ablaze, a tree which is meant to suggest a weirwood which are often shown as being a burning tree with their fiery red leaves. And it seems it was this symbolic hammer of lightning that gave the tree the fire of life and the power of the gods, which makes sense as we know the weirwoods contain the magic and power of the old gods. And it's this fire that was received from the calling down of a symbolic hammer that the Grey King is thought to have possessed and made his thrall through the story of Naga, suggesting this green seer as possessing the life fire of a giant being who is weirwood associated, whose bones were turned to stone. Another example of lightning striking trees is the castle of Winterfell itself, which is presented to us as a monstrous stone tree that we find has also been hit by lightning, which also set it afire, giving us a symbolic hammer from above, striking a symbolic weirwood and giving it the fire of life in a place we expect giants to rise up from beneath the earth. And let's not forget that Winterfell is also presented to us by John and Cat as a giant stone man with blood pumping through its veins who is struck by lightning symbolically giving this giant stone man life from the power of the gods above, much like in some versions of the story of Frankenstein, with lightning seemingly giving the undead giant the gift of life. And by no coincidence, if we look to the stone kings of winter beneath the earth in the Winterfell crypts, 
There just so happens to be a stone Stark named by George as Donar, which just so happens to be the old high German name for Thor, and literally means thunder, further associating hammers and lightning with our giants we expect to wake in the earth, the stone kings of winter. And if we're looking for lightning and stone king associations that George might be using to foreshadow our theory, let's not forget the giant nameless stone kings wielding broken thunderbolts that Danny notices as she first enters Vase Dothrak. Showing us giant stone kings seated on thrones who are nameless like the old gods, wielding the power of lightning, reminding us of the power of the weirwoods, symbolic hammers, and therefore the hammer of the waters yet again. In fact, if we look to our Azor High parallel characters we've discussed throughout this series so far, that George has been using to foreshadow our stone warriors beneath the earth that we think will wake, many of them give us lightning symbolism as well. And I think the reason for this is so George can foreshadow Azor High, the long night hero beneath Winterfell, waking from beneath the earth when a hammer of lightning is called down, most likely striking the heart tree and giving life to the beings beneath it. The first example is Beric Dondarrion, a resurrected one-eyed Azor High character beneath a weirwood, described as made of stone, who also has the title of the Lightning Lord. Our next example is Sir Waymar Royce, another resurrected one-eyed Azor High character who is associated with protective magical armour, whose sword ends up broken and is described as a tree hit by lightning. And let's not forget the Titan of Bravos, another resurrected symbolic one-eyed stone giant that is said to wake in defence of its city, whose horns when blown to create its roaring sound are described as sounding like thunder. And if we're looking for thunder and lightning connections to giants waking in the earth, we can't go past Tormund Giant's Bane, because if we look closely, it seems Tormund is likely inspired by Thor as well who not only has a phonetically similar name in Tor and Thor, but also shows us thunder symbolism through one of his titles, which happens to be Tormund Thunderfist. And to further this connection, we also find that Thor is said to have attempted to slay a sleeping giant in an ancient folk tale, just like we hear Tormund doing in one of his tall tales, which further connects Tormund to lightning, thunder and hammers through his inspiration of Thor. And the reason this is interesting is because Tormund Thunderfist is also known as Tormund Hornblower, and this seems significant as his name bears a striking resemblance to Joraman, who we knew blew the horn of winter and woke giants in the earth. Connecting thunder, hammers, horns and giants waking once again. But I think one of the best suggestions we're given that the Hammer of the Waters and the Horn of Winter are related somehow and both wake giants in the earth is through the seat of the House of Good Brother on Great Wick. And that place is a castle named Hammerhorn, which by name alone shows us George deliberately associating horns with hammers, two things in the series that are said to wake giants in the earth and to seemingly confirm this connection between storms, hammers, horns and giants waking, as Aeron Damper approaches Hammerhorn in a feast for crows, thinking of the coming storm left in the wake of Balon Greyjoy's death, we hear this interesting symbolic environmental description. He was born a lord's son and died a king, murdered by a jealous god, Aeron thought, and now the storm is coming, a storm such as these isles have never known. It was long after dark by the time the priest espied the spiky iron battlements of the Hammerhorn clawing at the crescent moon. Gorald's keep was hulking and blocky, its great stones quarried from the cliff that loomed behind it. Below its walls, the entrances of caves and ancient mines yawned like toothless black mouths. Giving us a giant anthropomorphized stone castle reaching up from beneath the ground yet again giving us symbolic waking stone giants at the place we see named by George as Hammerhorn, immediately after considering a coming storm. And this idea of sleeping giants is only furthered by the stone cliffs behind the Hammerhorn, 
which are presented as anthropomorphized stone giants as well, who are interestingly shown as yawning, symbolically presenting us with a waking stone giant in a place named Hammerhorn, with hammers and horns being two things in the series that are said to wake giants in the earth, furthering our theory that the horn and the hammer of the waters are related somehow, and in my opinion, when carried out again in future books of A Song of Ice and Fire, is the waking of the ancient stone kings of winter that we think were sacrificed by the weirwood woman and her sickle blade in Bran's weirwood vision. And to further this connection to the weirwood woman at Winterfell, not only do we see a crescent moon present at Hammerhorn in the introduction to the castle, but we also find that the island of Great Wick on which Hammerhorn resides on is by no coincidence shaped like a sickle or crescent moon as well, giving us two associations with the weirwood woman's blade who we think sacrificed our kings and gave them the ability to live extended lives beneath the Winterfell heart tree. And just as we've seen Hammerhorn presented as a giant stone being, if we look to Moat Caelan, one of the places the Hammer of the Waters was called down, we find more symbolic lightning and more evidence of a giant being having been present here too. Moat Caelan is one of the locations that the Hammer of the Waters was said to have been called forth by the children. And if we pay close attention while Catelyn and Theon visit this ancient place, we find several symbolic hints to suggest giant beings having been present here in the past, and therefore more foreshadowing that the Hammer of the Waters did in fact wake giants in the earth. But before we discuss these symbolic giants, I have to point out that we're also presented with the symbol of lightning here too, through Ralph Kenning, an ironborn warrior left in charge of Moat Caelan while Theon visits the site in a dance with dragons whose shield bore the storm god's cloudy hand, which shows lightning crackling from his fingers down to a raging sea, showing George drawing a deliberate connection between the storm god's lightning and the hammer of the waters. And if we look to the details around the hammer of the waters, we find out that it was supposedly called down from atop the children's tower. And when Catelyn visits this ancient site in A Game of Thrones, she notes that the standard raised on the children's tower is that of the Umbers, whose sigil is a roaring giant in broken chains, symbolically suggesting a giant being freed from bondage when the children called forth the Hammer of the Waters, which woke giants in the earth. And to further this idea, we see even more symbolic language around this same tower that further suggests a giant being having been present here too in this quote from A Game of Thrones. The tall, slender children's tower, where legend said the children of the forest had once called upon their nameless gods to send the hammer of the waters, had lost half its crown. It looked as if some great beast had taken a bite out of the crenellations along the tower top and spit the rubble across the bog, suggesting to us that a great beast was present here in the past and reinforcing the idea that perhaps giant beings did in fact wake in the earth when the hammer of the waters was called down. And interestingly, if we look to the Winterfell crypts, a place we expect giants to awake in the earth, we actually find this same language repeated, suggesting a symbolic great beast being present beneath Winterfell as Lewin tries to convince Bran and Rickon that their father is not in the crypts in this quote from A Game of Thrones. Maester Lewin stepped towards the open sepulchre, torch in hand. As you see, he's not here, nor will he be for many a year. Dreams are only dreams, child. He thrust his arm into the blackness inside the tomb, as into the mouth of some great beast. Further connecting the Hammer of the Waters to the crypts of Winterfell, with both having suggestions of giant beings described as great beasts being present at both these locations. And this idea of giant beings having been present at Moat Caelan is furthered when we hear Theon describe Moat Caelan with some rather interesting language in this quote from A Dance with Dragons. Where once a mighty curtain wall had stood, only scattered stones remained, blocks of black basalt so large 
it must once have taken a hundred men to hoist them into place. Some had sunk so deep into the bog that only a corner showed. Others laid strewn about like some god's abandoned toys. As you've just heard, we see the large blocks of stone buried in the earth described as the toys of some giant god, with toys implying this giant as a child. Just as I'm suggesting the children were controlling giants during the hammer of the waters. And in addition to this, the child we know closest to a god, Bran Stark, has been skin changing a giant in Hodor throughout the series so far, giving us a child controlling a giant who is currently learning to become a greenseer who have the ability to wake giants in the earth. And rather amazingly, we see this same language repeated to reinforce this idea in A Game of Thrones, when Catelyn describes these same blocks of stone as scattered and tumbled like a child's wooden blocks, once again symbolically implying a giant child at the location of the Hammer of the Waters, or as my theory suggests, a giant being controlled by a child. So as you can see, at this site we hear the Hammer of the Waters was called down, we find giants in broken chains, great beasts present, and giant beings suggested as children. And to further our theory, George seems to be presenting us with two other symbolic Hammer of the Waters events throughout the series, which are meant to inform us of what happened during this magical event. And the first I'd like to discuss shows us thunder, the world breaking, heart trees burning, and beings waking from stone. The waking of Danny's three dragons in the funeral pyre at the end of book one is a very interesting and magical event, which if we read through carefully, shows us multiple clues that suggest this magical funeral pyre as a symbolic Hammer of the Waters event too, which is very interesting as the outcome of this symbolic Hammer of the Waters is that we find beings waking from stone. And I think the reason George is showing us Danny's waking of stone dragons as a Hammer of the Waters event is to foreshadow the Hammer of the Waters waking a symbolic stone dragon, Azor Ahai, the King of Winter, from beneath the earth. But first, the reason I think Danny's magical waking of dragons from stone is a Hammer of the Waters event is due to the fact that towards the end of the funeral pyre, just before the waking of beings from stone, Danny hears a crack from the fire that was as loud and sharp as the breaking of the world, which is the exact thing that the Hammer of the Waters resulted in, the breaking of the world in two. And to further the idea that the Hammer of the Waters involved lightning striking a weirwood to wake stone beings beneath it, just prior to this symbolic breaking of the world, we find that the second crack is described as loud and sharp as thunder, with this thunderous sound coming from wood described as having a secret heart, meant to symbolically represent the heart trees, which gives us lightning striking a weirwood once again right before the world is described as breaking in two and we see beings wake from stone. And to further this connection to the Hammer of the Waters, if we look to the beginning of the funeral pyre in which Drogo, Miri and Rago are placed in, we find the pyre described as sounding as if it roared like some great beast. Just like we saw a symbolic great beast having been present at Moat Kaelin, and the symbolic great beast we see presented in the Winterfell crypts, the place we expect giants to wake in the earth. Another parallel we find between this Hammer of the Waters event and the idea of Stone King's waking is in the language used around Danny observing the fire of Drogo's funeral pyre as looking like fiery women dancing before we see dragons waking from stone. Which is also something we find in the Winterfell crypts too, with Bran describing the fire of Osha's torch as stretching upward like a girl on her toes, giving us more fiery women just before we see the Stone Kings of Winter rising, who are symbolic dragons foreshadowed to wake from stone. And if we look to an earlier Danny chapter, when Miri Mazdor claims she can save Drogo for Danny, we see Miri using a leaf-shaped blade and singing 
to resurrect Drogo, potentially connecting this magic to the magic of the children of the forest, whose magic involves singing and are closely associated with trees and therefore leaves. And finally, during Miri Mazdur's Tent of Dancing Shadows, in which Miri attempts to resurrect Drogo before the symbolic hammer of the water's funeral pyre, we see something that resembles our Kings of Winter appear in the tent with Miri, in this quote from A Game of Thrones. What was wrong with them? Couldn't they see? Inside the tent, the shapes were dancing, circling the brazier and the bloody bath, dark against the sand silk, and some did not look human. She glimpsed the shadow of a great wolf and another like a man wreathed in flames. Giving us a fiery man and a great wolf, or perhaps a dire wolf, dancing around Drogo's body, which is then used in a Hammer of the Waters event, which results in dragons waking from stone. So as you've just seen, at this magical event which seems to be symbolising the Hammer of the Waters, we find the breaking of the world, thunder and lightning striking symbolic heart trees, great beasts waking, and beings waking from stone which in my opinion only furthers the idea that the Hammer of the Waters does involve a symbolic hammer of lightning striking a weirwood and waking beings from stone. And if we look through the series, we find a second major event that occurs in the Storm of Swords that also shows us Hammer of the Waters symbolism. And if we look closely, we find lightning striking an arm and stone giants to further our theory. Interestingly, the trial by combat between Oberyn Martell and Gregor Clegane, more commonly known as the Mountain vs. the Viper, also shows us some Hammer of the Water symbolism as well, which is rather interesting as one of the combatants happens to be symbolically presented as a giant stone man, who as we've already discussed in a previous video, foreshadows our giant stone Starks beneath Winterfell. And the reason I think this is another symbolic Hammer of the Waters event is due to the language we find as the fight begins to draw to a close in this quote from A Storm of Swords. Prince Oberyn tilted his dinted metal shield. A shaft of sunlight blazed blindingly off polished gold and copper into the narrow slit of his foe's helm. Clegane lifted his own shield against the glare. Prince Oberyn's spear flashed like lightning and found the gap in the heavy plate, the joint under the arm. Giving us an example of symbolic lightning striking Gregor's arm, reminding us of the Hammer of the Waters, which we think is a symbolic hammer of lightning, which is said to have struck the Arm of Dawn, resulting in giants waking from the earth. And once again shows us lightning striking a giant stone man, just as we've seen at Winterfell. And interestingly, this giant stone man Gregor Clegane is set to be resurrected as Sir Robert Strong, with strong meaning Stark. And to further this connection to the Hammer of the Waters, when we hear Tyrion describe this stone giant approaching the fight, he feels as though the ground is shaking as he walks. Just as the ground was said to shake during the Hammer of the Waters, in which we think giants woke in the earth. And amazingly, we also see some familiar language around giants, children and toys surrounding this symbolic hammer of the waters too, just like we saw present at Moat Kaelin, an actual hammer of the waters location that implies children controlling these giants once again. The first thing to note is that this stone giant is the champion of Cersei Lannister, fighting on her behalf after Joffrey's death, and interestingly, we hear from Tyrion that Cersei seemed half a child herself besides Sir Gregor, symbolically showing us a stone giant fighting on a child's behalf, much like we think the children were skin-changing giants to fight on their behalf during the Hammer of the Waters. And to further this line of symbolism suggesting children controlling giants, Tyrion even compares Gregor to a toy in the same chapter symbolically suggesting this stone giant as a child's toy, which I think is meant to foreshadow a giant being controlled by a child once again. Giving us a giant stone man 
meant to represent the stone Starks beneath Winterfell being controlled by a child, just as we hear Bran doing with Hodor, which I think foreshadows the idea of Bran skin changing and using the stone men beneath Winterfell to fight on his behalf. Using these stone men, like a child, plays with his toys. And if we look further through the series, we find even more connections to suggest the stone kings beneath Winterfell being the giants that wake when the hammer of the waters is called down. The first example I'd like to discuss that George shows us to hint at this connection between the hammers and our stone kings of winter begins at Old Stones, where we find an anthropomorphized stone king we discussed in part four, who we see wielding a stone hammer. And by no coincidence, this anthropomorphized stone king was known as the Hammer of Justice, which is a very interesting title that sounds remarkably like the Hammer of the Waters, suggesting a connection between stone kings and the Hammer of the Waters yet again. And this stone king's hammer happens to be carved with runes of the first men, just like we see on the crown of the kings of winter and the false horn of winter as well. But the most interesting aspect of this stone king is that his name happens to be Christopher, a name that George has likely derived from Lucifer for a very important reason. And the reason is, if we look to the real world story of Dante's Inferno, we find that Lucifer happens to be frozen in the ninth circle of hell, not only giving us the reoccurring nine symbolism we've seen around the kings of winter, but also the idea of residing in a frozen hell as well, something we hear Ned dwell on in King's Landing, telling himself that the Starks must have a frozen hell reserved for them. And just like the first kings of winter, Lucifer happens to be frozen at the lowest level of the underworld, just like we think the first kings of winter are frozen in stone at the lowest level of the symbolic underworld of the crypts as well. And finally, as some of you will already know, the name Lucifer in Latin literally means Lightbringer, connecting this hammer-wielding stone king with Lightbringer and therefore Azor Ahai as well. Just as we suspect Azor Ahai became a stone king of winter, a Luciferian figure frozen at the lowest level of the symbolic underworld of the Winterfell crypts. And due to his association with hammers and his title of the Hammer of Justice, I think this is more clever foreshadowing from George that the Hammer of the Waters wakes the Stone King of Winter, Azor Ahai, from the lowest level of the Winterfell crypts, allowing him to wake as a giant beneath the earth. And to further this connection, if we look to another character within universe with the same name as this Stone King, we find an Ironborn character named Christopher Botley. And there's one particular quote from the Wayward Bride chapter in A Dance with Dragons that only furthers our theory. Hagen, blow your horn and make the forest shake. Triss, don some mail. It's time you tried out that sweet sword of yours. Giving us a horn blowing, which causes the trees to shake, and a character meant to represent a stone king donning his armour and grabbing a special sword in response to this tree-shaking horn blow. Associating hammers, horns, stone kings and Azor Ahai waking from the trees once again. And if we look to the stone giants beneath Winterfell, we see some rather clever language used around Jon's dream of the kings of winter that suggests their waking as being tied to horns and hammers, which only furthers our theory. The first example occurs in A Game of Thrones, happening immediately after Jon describes the first stage of his Winterfell crypt stream to Sam, which in future iterations eventuates in the king's waking from the crypt, with Jon asking Sam if he dreams of Horn Hill straight after this dream, which seems to be a very interesting and deliberate addition by George. And later, in A Game of Thrones, when this dream we've seen associated with horns goes further than before, we actually witness the Kings of Winter waking in the crypts in Jon's dream, to which Jon wakes and by no coincidence finds that his heart was hammering. 
once again connecting giants waking beneath the earth with hammers and horns, just as our theory suggests. And finally, before we move on to look at Bran Stark, there's one more stone ruler that seems to be associated with the Hammer of the Waters that I have to mention, and that person has been given the title of the Bloodstone Emperor. And the reason for this association is that at the site one of the hammers was called down on, the Broken Arm of Dawn, we find that one of the islands is named Bloodstone Island, essentially giving us the name of the Bloodstone Emperor, whose very name suggests him as a stone ruler or stone king who seemingly killed a woman close to him in the Amethyst Empress around the Long Night. Just like we hear of Azor Ahai killing Nissa Nissa around the time of the Long Night as well, a person we think spilled his own blood to become stone and now awaits in the depths of the Winterfell crypts for the next Greenseer to call forth the Hammer of the Waters and wake him from beneath the earth. But more on the Bloodstone Emperor in my next series. Now before we move on to discuss our next Greenseer, Bran Stark, let's quickly recap what we've discussed so far. It's said that Greenseers can call down the Hammer of the Waters and wake giants in the earth. Lightning is known as a symbolic hammer of the gods that strikes down from above. We see green seers being associated with the storm god calling down lightning and striking weirwoods. And George is symbolically showing us lightning, weirwoods and giants having been present at Hammer of the Waters events, leading me to believe that the green seers are able to call forth a symbolic hammer of lightning from the storm god above, striking a weirwood and giving the power of the gods to the green seers and the fire of life to the giant beings beneath the trees. And as these giants rose from beneath the ground, great cracks appeared in the earth and hills and mountains collapsed and were swallowed up. With the resulting storm and wind caused by the summoning of this lightning creating tidal waves, remembered as the fact that the seas came rushing in and the arm of dawn was broken and shattered by the force of the water until only a few bare rocky islands remained above the waves. And in my opinion, the next hammer of the waters, which involves lightning striking a weirwood and waking giants from beneath the earth, is going to occur at Winterfell because we find giants foreshadowed to rise beneath the earth at Winterfell, who are associated with Thor and therefore lightning and hammers. Winterfell itself is presented as a stone tree struck by lightning and as a giant stone man struck by lightning as well. Bran Stark needs to become a Greenseer who is said to have the ability to call down a symbolic hammer of lightning and wake giants in the earth. And as we are about to discuss, Bran Stark has been shown skin changing a giant around a symbolic hammer of lightning already. Leading me to believe that Bran Stark might be the next Greenseer who will wake giants in the earth, and in my opinion, may be piloting them using his skin changing and green seeing abilities to save the realms of men. An idea foreshadowed by Bran's continued skin changing of the simple minded giant. Hodor. Bran Stark is by far one of the most magical characters in A Song of Ice and Fire, being called north to learn to become a Greenseer and develop his skin-changing abilities, magic which seems to be pivotal in defeating the others and ending the Long Night. This is reinforced by the fact that his plot arc so far has paralleled that of the last hero's journey a probable Stark who also travelled north beyond the wall with a dog and his companions to gain magic from the children of the forest that is said to be crucial in defeating the others and winning the war for the dawn. And to further this idea of Bran being key to defeating the others, Bran's name also happens to derive from the Old Norse word Brander which means flaming sword, giving us Bran as implied as a version of Lightbringer, the weapon used to end the Long Night. And just like Lightbringer, 
and the last hero's sword, Bran is given the moniker of Bran the Broken, which seems to only further foreshadow Bran as a weapon against the others. And interestingly, just as Bran is described as broken, so too is Winterfell, with Bran even directly comparing himself to the castle, thinking that as long as the Weirwood remained and the Stone Kings beneath the earth remained, then Winterfell was not dead, just broken, like him, comparing the trees and the Stone Kings beneath the earth to Bran and Lightbringer as well, which makes sense as I think the giants stored beneath the earth here were stored to be a weapon for Bran to use to end the long night. And in my opinion, is also the reason Bran Stark is described as broken, with his skin changing and green seeing abilities he needs to learn from Bloodraven and the Children of the Forest being a weapon needed to defeat the others, making this magical ability a version of Lightbringer as well. And in my opinion, is the reason he needs to become a green seer so he can call forth a symbolic hammer of lightning to set the tree ablaze and wake his giant ancestors from the earth. Which I think is why George keeps showing us lightning around Bran gaining this magic, and why we see lightning present as Bran skin changes the giant for the first time as well. Now as we know, Bran Stark loved to climb Winterfell at the beginning of the series, climbing so much in fact that old Nan told him a story about a bad little boy who climbed too high and was struck down by lightning, and how afterwards the crows came to peck out his eyes, with old Nan using this story to attempt to dissuade Bran from climbing. But what's interesting is that old Nan mentions that this bad little boy had crows come to peck out his eyes after this lightning struck him, which is something we see with Bran after his fall from a tower in Winterfell as well. And knowing that this fall was the catalyst for the awakening of Bran's skin-changing abilities, with the pecking out of his eyes by the three-eyed crow being the symbol for Bran's third eye opening and the gaining of this magic, this is George very clearly associating a symbolic hammer of lightning with Bran's skin-changing and green-seeing abilities. A boy who must learn to become a green-seer to save the realms of men who are said to be able to call down the hammer of the waters, which we think is lightning, and wake giants in the earth. And knowing that the hammer of the waters was likely lightning which woke giants, it's very interesting that the first time Bran skin changes the simple-minded giant Hodor at Queen's Crown, we see lightning present again, which in my opinion suggests Greenseers calling down a symbolic hammer of lightning and skin changing giants. And by no coincidence, this large stone tower that this occurs in is presented to us as wearing a crown, symbolically suggesting Bran skin changing inside a giant stone king as this lightning occurs. And to further this idea, while inside this tall stone structure, meant to represent a giant stone king, Mira remarks at the top of the tower that she feels like a giant standing high above the world. And I think the idea of Bran skin changing a giant around lightning while inside a giant stone structure wearing a crown is to foreshadow Bran skin changing the giant stone kings of winter, slipping inside these giant stone warriors to defend the realms of men. And I think this idea of his green seeing and skin changing abilities allowing him to become a warrior is further foreshadowed by the repeated notion that Bran wishes that he could become a knight, which is something we see repeated often. And rather interestingly, Bran has become so disappointed with his disability that he thinks that magic might allow him to become a knight, thinking to himself that as long as there was magic, broken boys could grow up to be knights. And this idea of the magic of the old gods allowing him to become a knight is only furthered when Bran wonders if the green men on the Isle of Faces other probable greenseers could turn him into a knight as well. And knowing that skin changing is one of their main powers, I think this is foreshadowing of Bran skin changing a giant beneath the earth to become a knight using the power of his mind. In fact, Lewin even asks Bran rather cleverly if he would ever like to become a knight of the mind, foreshadowing Bran as becoming a knight through the use of his skin changing abilities, which as we're about to discuss, is something we actually see Bran doing 
with Hodor. And this idea seems to be further suggested when Bran thinks to himself that if he can't be a knight, maybe he and Hodor could be a knight together, giving us the idea of Bran living out his dream of becoming a knight by joining with another being and controlling it to fight, a skill Bran thinks the Greenseers might be able to give him, a skill which Bran now has and is presented as being necessary for ending the long night. And while this is clearly foreshadowing for Bran skin-changing and effectively body-snatching Hodor to fight as a Knight of the Mind, I think this also foreshadows Bran skin-changing the giant Kings of Winter as well. And the reason for this is because Hodor himself shows us some very interesting symbolism that presents him as a symbolic giant King of Winter, waking from the crypts. The most interesting aspect about Bran and his skin changing of Hodor is the fact that Hodor parallels our Stone Kings of Winter all throughout the books. And as we are about to see, I think the reason is to foreshadow the idea of Bran becoming a Knight of the Mind and controlling the giants that wake from beneath Winterfell at the Battle for the Dawn. The first thing to note is that in A Dance with Dragons, on the approach to Bloodraven's Cave, we actually find Bran fighting whites while skin-changing Hodor, which is in itself good foreshadowing for Bran using giants to fight whites and potentially the others at the Battle for the Dawn. But the most interesting thing to note is that just prior to this fight in which we find Bran skin-changing a giant and fighting the whites of the others, we find some very familiar language and symbols around Hodor that we've seen around other Azor Ahai King of Winter characters in this quote from A Dance with Dragons. The snow was falling again, wet and heavy. Hodor walked with one eye frozen shut, his thick brown beard a tangle of hoarfrost, icicles drooping from the ends of his bushy moustache. One gloved hand still clutched the rusty iron longsword he had taken from the crypts below Winterfell, which shows Hodor with the one-eyed symbolism we've seen around all our other Azor High parallel characters as well as a beard of ice, which reminds us of a King of Winter in Edric Snowbeard, a name very close to a known name of Azor High, Eldric Shadowchaser, while holding an ancient red sword that belonged to a King of Winter from the crypts, reminding us of the red sword of heroes that Azor High was said to have, showing us a giant with one eye and a red sword of a King of Winter being piloted by Bran as he fights the minions of the others just as I'm suggesting we'll see Bran wake and control the Kings of Winter as they rise from the bottom of the crypts. And to further this idea that Hodor is representing the Kings of Winter beneath Winterfell, we even see Hodor breaking out of the crypts at the end of A Clash of Kings, giving us this giant breaking out of his imprisonment of the crypts under direction from Bran while wielding a red sword. Also note, that as Hodor breaks through the door and emerges from the crypts, we hear of a dull rumble coming from above, giving us lightning and thunder symbolism as a giant rises from beneath the earth yet again. And to seemingly confirm this idea of Hodor representing the Kings of Winter and therefore foreshadows Bran controlling the Kings of Winter, if we look to the name Hodor, it bears a striking resemblance to a Norse god whose name is Hodor and by no coincidence is a blind god and a god of winter, reminding us of the kings of winter with their blind stone eyes. So as you can see, Hodor very clearly represents the giant kings of winter, with his wielding of a king of winter's red sword, his symbolic one eye and snowy beard, who breaks free from the crypts, just as we expect the kings of winter to do. And the reason Hodor is symbolically paralleling the giant kings of winter in the crypts is to foreshadow the idea of Bran skin changing the giant kings of winter and using them to fight the whites and the others on his behalf. We also find this idea of Bran Stark skin changing the kings of winter beneath the earth further suggested through a commonly used metaphor the characters within universe use for skin changing one of those being Varimir Sixskins, who compares wearing the skin of another being to wearing a boot, in this quote, from A Dance with Dragons. Dogs were the easiest beasts to bond with. They lived so close to men, 
that they were almost human. Slipping into a dog skin was like putting on an old boot, its leather softened by wear. As a boot was shaped to accept a foot, a dog was shaped to accept a collar, even a collar no human eye could see. And George gives us this same language repeated when Bran contemplates the difficulty of skin-changing Hodor in this quote from A Storm of Swords. He slipped his skin and reached for Hodor. It was not like sliding into summer. That was so easy now that Bran hardly thought about it. This was harder, like trying to pull a left boot on your right foot. It fit all wrong, and the boot was scared too. The boot didn't know what was happening. The boot was pushing the foot away. And the reason I bring this boot analogy up is because when John thinks of the giants that wake when the horn of winter is sounded, who have great swords 10 feet long and live in huge castles, the ones we speculate might refer to the kings of winter, John also remarks that they had boots a boy could hide in. Which I think is George's clever way of foreshadowing a boy like Bran slipping into the skins of the giant kings of winter just as our theory suggests. Which is something we see further foreshadowed at a snow version of Winterfell with Sansa Stark and Robert Aaron. Some of the best foreshadowing we find for a child controlling a giant at Winterfell happens to be while Sansa is building a snow version of Winterfell in the Eyrie, while discussing the castle with Robert Aaron in this quote from A Storm of Swords. Winterfell is the seat of House Stark, Sansa told her husband to be, the great castle of the north. It's not so great, the boy knelt before the gatehouse. Look, here comes a giant to knock it down. He stood his doll in the snow and moved it jerkily. Tromp, tromp, I'm a giant, I'm a giant, he chanted. Ho, 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 open your gates or I'll mash them and smash them. Swinging the doll by the legs, he knocked the top off one gatehouse tower and then the other. It was more than Sansa could stand. Robert stopped that. Instead, he swung the doll again and a foot of wall exploded. What we've just been presented with here by George is a child controlling a giant and knocking down the walls of Winterfell, which I think is foreshadowing for what we'll see when Bran slips into the stone giants in the crypts, destroying the walls as he controls them and rises from beneath the earth to become the knight he always dreamt of being. And also note that this giant controlled by a child is said to have knocked the top off the gatehouse tower, reminding us of the top of the children's tower at Moat Caelan, which was suggested as having been damaged by a giant being as well, a place the hammer of the waters was called down and giants woke in the earth. With Moat Caelan and this snowy version of Winterfell, showing us the same toy symbolism we've seen at both locations. But the idea of Stark children controlling giants goes even further than this. One Weg One Da One is a giant that we first meet beyond the wall, resting at the Grove of Nine Weirwoods as John and the new recruits approach to take their vows in a dance with dragons. And as we spoke about in part two, one one is presented to us in this scene as a boulder coming to life, which gives us a symbolic stone giant waking from beneath the weirwood. And this symbolic stone giant one one is directly compared to Hodor by Jon Snow, another giant in the series who is currently being controlled by a Stark child. And the interesting thing about this giant meant to represent Hodor is that George actually compares a skin-changing Stark child to this giant when we find one one having killed Sir Patrick Malister just prior to John's death in this quote from A Dance with Dragons. The screaming had stopped by the time they came to Harden's Tower, but one weg one da one was still roaring. The giant was dangling a bloody corpse by one leg, the same way Arya used to dangle her doll when she was small, swinging it like a morning star when menaced by vegetables. Which is an interesting addition by George, as we find this symbolic stone giant being compared to a skin-changing Stark child in Arya. And this giant who was suggested as being controlled by a Stark child 
is also symbolically wielding a morning star, which is a name suggestive of Lightbringer, further foreshadowing a Stark child controlling a giant as a weapon to defeat the others. And amazingly, this idea is furthered when we look at the person on the receiving end of One One's violence, as we hear that Sir Patrick Malister wears a white cloak, which is described as being patterned with blue stars. Symbolically suggesting this victim of a Stark child controlling a giant as an other, with their snowy white colouring and eyes, which are often referred to as blue stars. Giving us one one as a symbolic stone giant awoken from beneath a weirwood, who is compared directly to Hodor, suggested as being controlled by a Stark skin changing child and fighting the others. Just like we've already seen with Bran skin-changing a giant in Hodor to fight the minions of the others near Bloodraven's cave beyond the wall. And just like I suspect, we'll see Bran doing with the stone giants beneath Winterfell as well. And the examples of a Stark child with skin-changing abilities being closely associated with giants just keeps on coming. Our next example happens to be Rob Stark, who is referred to through the series as a boy king, a name which refers to him as a child due to his young age. And rather deliberately by George, this boy king's right hand happens to be the great John Umber, presenting to us another Stark child with skin-changing abilities with a giant in broken chains as a right-hand man. And to further our theory of Stark children's skin-changing giants, we hear it cleverly suggested that Rob has been doing just this when Arya overhears some guards in Harrenhal discussing the seemingly magical abilities of the boy king Rob Stark in this quote from A Clash of Kings. A group of archers in leather jerkins and iron helms went past, their bows slung across their shoulders. Arya heard snatches of their talk. Giants, I tell you. He's got giants 20 foot tall, come down from beyond the wall, follow him like dogs. Which is very interesting, because as we all know, the reason dogs follow Starks is because they are wargs and are following them because they share a skin changing bond. And by saying that giants follow Rob Stark like dogs, cleverly implies the idea of a Stark child skin changing giants yet again. But these examples aren't the only evidence we find to suggest Stark children controlling giants, as there happens to be another Bran Stark in the series who also worked with the magic of the Children of the Forest, who was alive around the time of the Long Night, and just like our Bran Stark, may have also been skin-changing giants. Bran the Builder is the founder of House Stark itself and is said to have built many fascinating locations around Westeros, including the Wall, Winterfell, Storm's End and the High Tower. And if we look to the myths surrounding this mysterious figure, it appears that magic and giants are seemingly involved in his methods of construction. The first thing I'd like to note is that in the legend of the building of Storm's End, we hear that Bran the Builder is described as a small boy during the construction of this ancient castle. But how could a small boy have any knowledge or skills to assist in the building of these massive and legendary locations? Well, if we look closely, it appears that Bran the Builder had a close association with the old gods and the children of the forest, seemingly seeking their assistance when raising the wall after the long night, even learning to speak their language in order to utilise their magic, which sounds very reminiscent of another Brandon Stark we know, who is also a small boy and sought out the magic of the children of the forest as well. And to further his connection to the magic of the old gods and the weirwoods, it seems as though Bran the Builder chose to build the ancestral seat of his house and most likely the crypts below the earth around an existing weirwood, due to the fact we hear from Catelyn in the Game of Thrones that the eyes of the Winterfell heart tree had seen Bran the Builder set the first stone of the castle, a weirwood that Bran the Builder would eventually be buried beneath. 
and to confirm the idea that Bran the Builder worshipped the old gods, we hear it directly noted in the world of ice and fire that he would pray to the heart tree in the god's wood of Winterfell. And considering all this, what I'm suggesting is that Bran the Builder was most likely a skin changer and a green seer, just like his descendant with the same name, Bran Stark. And when he sought out the children, they awoke his genetic powers, just as we've seen with our current Bran Stark. And if this is true, would make sense as to how he had the knowledge to build such incredible structures, potentially using his green seer abilities to see through time and learn the necessary skills required to build the round towers at Winterfell and Storm's End, the same round towers that seemingly don't fit the timeline of ancient Westeros. And if Bran the Builder was in fact a green seer and skin changer, then it's very interesting that we consistently see giants being mentioned around his methods of construction, with quotes such as this describing their involvement with the construction of the wall. Legend has it that the giants helped raise the wall, using their great strength to wrestle the blocks of ice into place. There may be some truth to this, though the stories make the giants out to be far larger and more powerful than they truly were. These same legends also say that the children of the forest, who did not themselves build walls of either ice or stone, would contribute their magic to the construction. Note that we hear a specific mention that the children of the forest have no skills at building walls of ice or stone, but still contributed their magic, which I think not only refers to the magical warding of the wall that it seems the children have the ability to use, but might also allude to their use of skin-changing magic to build the wall as well. Because if we do some investigating, the idea of giants willingly building the wall seems like a contradiction, as we hear a song sung by Egret while John is beyond the wall called The Last of the Giants. And the message of this song seems to be that the building of the wall was a negative for the race of giants, mentioning the fact that the building of the wall reduced their access to their lands and seemingly contributed to the reduction in numbers of and eventual decline of the race of giants. So why would the giants help Bran the Builder build this wall if it contributed to their downfall and they ended up discarded on the wrong side of this protective barrier, alongside the enemy that this wall was seemingly built to withstand? Unless Bran the Builder, like our Bran the Broken, was using the magic of the children of the forest to forcibly body snatch these giants, just like we see with our current Bran Stark, body snatching the gentle giant, Hodor. In fact, to further this idea, when we hear John and Egret discussing the building of Queen's Crown in A Storm of Swords, and Egret questions how men built so high without giants, John thinks to himself that the giants had been a part of the construction of Winterfell. But the interesting thing to note here is that John doesn't think that the giants helped Bran the Builder to raise Winterfell. He thinks that Bran the Builder had used giants, with the word used possibly furthering our theory that Bran the Builder was indeed skin-changing and body-snatching giants and using them to build his legendary structures against their will. And if Bran the Builder was indeed skin-changing giants to build these locations, perhaps he was controlling more than one giant at a time, in the same way we see Varamyr Sixskins controlling multiple beings as well, and could potentially explain how this small boy built so many legendary structures in one lifetime. And so in addition to Bran the Builder possibly body snatching giants, and our current Bran Stark also body snatching a giant, there is one more ancient figure who might have also been a Brandon Stark that I think may have also been carrying out the known abomination of body snatching, as this Brandon Stark was said to have used strange sorceries and bound his sworn brothers to his will. The gathering gloom put Bran in mind of another of Old Nan's stories, the tale of Night's King. He had been the 13th man to lead the Night's Watch, she said, a warrior who knew no fear. And that was the fault in him, she would add, for all men 
must know fear. A woman was his downfall, a woman glimpsed from atop the wall, with skin as white as the moon and eyes like blue stars. Fearing nothing, he chased her and caught her and loved her, though her skin was cold as ice. And when he gave his seed to her, he gave his soul as well. He brought her back to the night fort and proclaimed her a queen and himself her king. And with strange sorceries, he bound his sworn brothers to his will. For 13 years they had ruled, night's king and his corpse queen, till finally the Stark of Winterfell and Joraman of the Wildlings had joined to free the Watch from bondage. After his fall, when it was found he had been sacrificing to the others, all records of Night's King had been destroyed, his very name forbidden. Some say he was a Bolton, old Nan would always end. Some say a Magna out of Skagos. Some say Umber, Flint or Nori. Some would have you think he was a Woodfoot, from them who ruled Bear Island before the Iron Men came. He never was. He was a Stark, the brother of the man who brought him down. She always pinched Bran on the nose then. He would never forget it. He was a Stark of Winterfell, and who can say? Mayhaps his name was Brandon. Mayhaps he slept in this very bed, in this very room. The aspect I find most interesting about this myth is the idea that the Night's King, who is suggested as a Brandon Stark, sought out strange sorceries beyond the wall that allowed him to bend his brothers to his will, just as we suspect Bran the Builder was bending the giants to his will, and Brandon Stark is currently bending Hodor to his will as well. Giving us three Brandon Starks through the series suggested a skin-changing and body-snatching other beings, carrying out a known abomination, which might be why the name of this Brandon Stark was struck from the record. And if we look closely, the Night's King seems to share a lot of parallels with the last hero, a person we have been discussing through the series so far that we think gained resurrective magic from beyond the wall that allowed him to sacrifice his 12 companions, turn them to stone for preservation and protection, and resurrect them in order to defeat the others. So let's discuss the similarities between these two ancient Stark figures. Firstly, the last hero is most likely a Stark. And as we've just heard, the Night's King is also most likely a Stark as well. The last hero went north beyond the wall. The Night's King also went north beyond the wall. The last hero gained magic from beyond the wall. The Night's King also gained magic from beyond the wall as well. The last hero formed the first Night's Watch with his 12 companions and was the 13th member of the Watch. The Night's King was the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. The last hero is never given a name. The Night's King had his name struck from the record. However, the last hero is remembered as ending the long night, but the Night's King is suggested as causing it. So why all these similarities between these two ancient Stark figures? And this is where my video becomes a bit more speculative and warrants further research, which I'm currently conducting for my next series. At this stage, I think that perhaps the last hero and the Night's King were the same person who went beyond the wall to retrieve strange sorceries. And this magic that they gained may have been the ability to sacrifice someone to a weirwood, turn their body to stone using grayscale as a means of protection and preservation, and then reanimating their corpses himself, forming a sort of king's guard of 12 stone warriors and controlling them using either the skin-changing magic of the children or the necromancy of the others. Which could be the same magic if the others are actually just skin-changing the dead controlling multiple dead bodies as whites in the same way Varamir Sixskins controls multiple living bodies to fight on his behalf. With one story remembering the positive aspects of this ancient Stark as the deeds of the last hero and his 12 companions who travelled north to gain an unknown magic to save the realms of men. 
and the negative aspects of this story remembered as the tale of the Knight's King, containing the heretical methods at which this success was achieved, which I think involved travelling north, stealing a female other, and using her to gain magic to carry out necromancy and body snatching, an ancient Stark who partook in a known abomination and could be why his name, and potentially the name of the last hero, was struck from the record. In the same way Jon Snow might be remembered as a hero by some who ended the long night, but remembered by others as an evil abomination who was resurrected around the fall of the long night, dividing the tale of one man into two. To further this idea, we hear that the Night's King gained these strange sorceries from the Corpse Queen, who is described as having moon pale skin, which interestingly reminds us of the Weirwood woman with her white hair and moon-shaped blade sacrificing to the Weirwoods in Bran's Weirwood vision, who slit the throat of a captive man that resulted in Bran tasting this blood. Which is interesting because the reason this vision occurred in the first place is because Bran was served blood to drink by a snow-associated white-haired child of the forest, Snowy Locks, in Blood Raven's cave, giving us a white-haired magical female serving Bran blood in the present and 8,000 years in the past as well. And interestingly, the bowl that Snowy Locks serves this blood to Bran in is described as being weirwood and carved with 12 faces. The same number of brothers both the last hero and the Night's King had preceded them, and the same number of brothers who we think may have been sacrificed to the Weirwoods, turned to stone, and stored beneath Winterfell. And if we think that Bran Stark will be skin changing these giants beneath the earth, whom I believe are the 12 Night's Watch brothers of the last hero Night's King, maybe the act of drinking their blood was to bond Bran to these 12 sacrificed stone warriors that we might see Bran resurrect using a hammer of the waters to fight the others in the battle for the dawn. There's also an interesting detail about the Stark of Winterfell and Joraman of the Wildlings joining to free the Watch from bondage, which is interesting as Joraman is also the person that blew the Horn of Winter and woke giants in the earth. Giants we think were sacrificed in front of heart trees and turned to stone to become the first Night's Watch, who were then stored beneath Winterfell, ready to rise again, making it very possible that the idea of Joraman freeing the Night's Watch from bondage might be the same as Joraman waking giants in the earth. And finally, if the Night's King, who is our proto-Stark we've been following, had a child with this female other, as the tale suggests in the giving of his seed to her, this would have been the first Stark, who we know is Bran the Builder, who we think has been body snatching giants and interestingly built a massive wall of ice, meaning the Starks would have the blood of the other and would be why we see so much icy symbolism in the Starks, like their inability to feel the cold, and why we have Starks with names like Edric Snowbeard and Brandon Ice Eyes, because they have the blood of the others in their line, making them a good other used to fight the others that come with the Long Night, and could also explain why Bran, the most powerful green seer we've seen, who we think will raise the dead stone kings of Winterfell and use their stone bodies to fight, is said to have blue eyes, and not the red or green eyes that Bloodraven states as being a sign of skin changing or green seeing powers, with his blue eyes possibly representing the fact that he will be using the power of the others that resides in the blood of the Starks to resurrect the dead from beneath Winterfell, making him a sort of good other, using their own magic of reanimating corpses against them. And if this moon associated weirwood woman was indeed a female other who was stolen by our proto Stark for her magic, Perhaps this angered the others, causing them to come down from the north to retrieve her, bringing with them the Long Night, which is something I'm going to discuss further in my next series titled The Moon Maiden of the Weirwoods. But while I'm researching this series, 
I'm also going to be releasing some shorter videos to appeal to a broader audience, containing more isolated ideas from within my Grayscale King's theory. I'll also release some new shorter theories I've been working on as well, and an extended version of this theory contained all within one video, with additional evidence I've found since completing the series. So remember to like this video, leave a comment and subscribe so you don't miss my future videos. Once again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone out there who has supported the channel so far. And if you have any ideas for theories or videos you'd like to see me make, let me know in the comments below. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.